All right, this is a basic review over the cranial nerves, uh, their functions, basic testing for them, and uh, basic findings in cranial nerve palsies. Um, so looking at their anatomy, um, again, not going into all the detail of nuclei and their whole pathways, but we do know they're going to synapse in the brain and the spinal cord. Right, because cranial nerves, they should all be synapsing in the brain, but cranial nerves number one and cranial nerve number two, so olfactory and optic, they're actually synapsing in the forebrain. And then cranial nerve number 10, 11, which is the spinal accessory nerve, right, this is the accessory, this is going to synapse in the actual, well, spinal cord. And these two are going to synapse in the forebrain. So that means the rest of them, so 3 through 10 and 12, are going to synapse in the brainstem themselves, right? So some are motor, some are sensory, some have motor and sensory fibers, and there's a multitude of nuclei throughout the brainstem that um, we're not going to cover in this uh, lecture, okay? So you can see on the left in blue, so in blue over here, we're looking at, so in blue here, so we're looking at all the afferent fibers. So afferent, so these are coming into the spinal cord, bringing in sensory information. So we're going to have things like somatic sensation from the face through the trigeminal nerve, through V1, V2, and V3. Um, we're going to have uh, sensory information coming in from 7, 9, and 10 for taste. Uh, somatic sensation to the pharynx from 9 and 10, that's also incoming information. The vagus nerve is also going to be bringing in sensory afferent information from uh, the viscera. Um, and also, obviously, you know, optic nerves bringing in uh, visual information that's afferent as well. Olfactory is bringing in afferent information about uh, the sense of smell. And cranial number 8, vestibular cochlear, we're bringing in afferent information about sense of smell as well as vestibular information. Now over here on the right in red, these are efferent fibers, so going away from the brain or spinal cord. So motor fibers, so oculomotor nerve, so, th so three, four, and six actually, so oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens, those move the six muscles and around the eye, so performing extraocular movements. Uh, oculomotor nerve also elevates the eyelid, um, so the levator palpebrae muscle. It also controls one of the muscles in the iris that causes pupillary constriction. Okay, five, so muscles of mastication. So that's your masseter, your temporalis, and your medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. Um, facial nerve, so muscles of facial expression from your forehead all the way down. So all the beautiful expressions you can make on your face. Um, what else do we got that's motor? Okay, oh yeah, so 12 would be doing all the muscles from the tongue and some of the superhyoid muscles. Uh, spinal accessory nerve would be doing the trapezius muscles to shrug the shoulders and turn the head. That's the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, and then also motor output to all the salivary glands. So cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, that's going to control the sublingual and submandibular gland. And the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to control the parotid gland. So those are your three um, salivary glands. And there's more, but that's just, a, I guess, a quick overview. So let's just show you another little nice overview here by Frank Netter. So, um, so we can see 1 through 12. So here's 1, olfactory. So remember, these are all paired. So there's 12 pairs of cranial nerves. We have to use Roman numerals to depict them. It's just the rule. So olfactory nerve, so sensory afferent fibers coming in. Okay, they dangle little fibers of the dorsal air, dorsal aspect of the um, nasal cavity. They bind to chemo, you know, they have chemoreceptors that bind to little chemicals in the air called odorants. And that's going to go all the way back to the temporal lobe, so the olfactory part of the cortex. Um, two, optic, so again, photoreceptors, so unique to the retina. So they absorb photons of light, all those rods and cones. They go through a couple different steps there, and it turns into action potentials. They're going to go back all the way to the visual cortex and occipital lobe. We'll go over that. Uh, three, four, and six, so again, extraocular movement, easy test, do the H test, um, and you can look for saccades and all the smooth pursuit um, of the um, extraocular movement through those six muscles that those control. Um, 
so that's all going to be sending motor signals away from the brain. Uh, so trigeminal nerve, so this is going to be sensory and motor. So muscles of mastication, sensation to the face, or somatic sensation. Um, and then seven, so a big thing with seven here is going to be muscles of facial expression, but also the taste of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is going to be the afferent or sensory portion of it. Um, also sublingual submandibular glands, and it's important for the stapedius reflex, which we'll touch on. Eight is purely sensory, so this is the vestibulocochlear nerve. So there's a vestibular branch and a cochlear branch. So I look at it like there's two nerves that just travel together because all the structures for hearing and uh, equilibrium are in the inner ear structures and the temporal bones, so they might as well run together. Um, so the, we'll talk about the vestibular structures. We'll talk about the hearing structures. Uh, nine, glossopharyngeal. So this is kind of a kind of a hodgepodge nerve, but it's doing sensory information, so the posterior one-third of the tongue, um, some of the sensation, some of the sensation to the pharynx. So when you test for gag reflex, you test nine and ten. Um, so the patient say, ah, and the soft palate rises. That's looking for the motor portions of nine and ten. Anyway, um, it's also going to control the parotid glands or salivary glands, just anterior to ear, in your ear, anterior to your ears. Um, and then it's also going to bring in sensory afferent information, or sorry, afferent information from the carotid sinus and the carotid bodies, right? And that's where measuring blood pressure, pH, carbon dioxide levels, and even oxygen levels in the blood. Okay, 10 is going to be the big one for the autonomic nervous system, specifically the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. Um, I'm going to put all that off for when we get to the autonomic nervous system and make it separate because we're not going to get into that. But at least for the head and neck, well, big things here are controlled a lot of the pharyngeal muscles, okay, so for swallowing. Um, also, the laryngeal muscles. So for speaking, there's these two nerve branches, well, meaning one on each side, called the recurrent laryngeal nerves, and they innervate some of those muscles. So when you're evaluating someone, you can, you know, ah, uh, look for the, the soft palate to rise, so there's con proper contraction of the pharyngeal muscles. You want to check gag reflex if you need to. It's not comfortable. Okay, that's the A for information. And then you listen to someone's voice. Someone's a hoarse voice, right? Lots of things are important for making actual speech. So your prop areas in your brain have to be working properly. We talked about broken Wernicke's area already. But also just think about the muscles in your tongue and your face, right? Those have to move correctly to get proper phonation, right? But the vagus nerve is actually controlling the laryngeal muscles that control the larynx. Accessory nerve number 11. So this is a purely motor nerve controlling the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So it's the muscle that mainly rotates the head to the opposite side. It also laterally flexes to the same side and flexes, you know, just bending your head forward. It's a flexion of the cervical spine. Um, but usually test it with rotation to the opposite side. And then trapezius muscles, so shrugging the shoulders. Hypoglossal nerve, the last one. So this is purely motor. Um, so the intrinsic muscles mean the muscles in the tongue. Extrinsic muscles mean the muscles around the tongue, like the floor of the mouth. Okay, so now let's keep going. So olfactory nerve. So we know this is for sense of smell. So this is a chart of things that you can look at to test this nerve in children. So Play-Doh's on there. I don't know. Common things would be like coffee, vanilla extract, citrus fruit, anything that smells strongly, I guess, uh, people should be able to identify. Uh, we saw the video with the scratch and sniff card. So if you use a scratch and sniff card, you know, someone doesn't have to close their eyes. But if you're putting an orange in front of their nose and they can't smell but they see an orange, they're going to think orange. Also, like we watched the other video, you can't have someone have both nostrils open. You got to close one at a time because it's a bilateral nerve. Usually if you have a cranial nerve palsy, you could just, it's damaged on, usually on one side, right? So obviously you got to close a nostril if you're using the actual object, close the eyes. If you're using a scratch and sniff card where you can't identify it through vision, then the eyes can be open. We saw all that. So anosmia, it's a lack of sense of smell. Um, so we had to differentiate this from, is it a cranial nerve palsy? Is it just a rhinitis or a viral infection affecting the nerve like COVID-19 or whatever? Um, and then we have to differentiate this from cranial nerve number five. So cranial nerve number five, don't forget, um, so if we go here, cranial nerve number five, so this is cranial nerve five, meaning you breathe in any kind of an irritant, right? 
ammonia, bleach, anything that irritates the actual nociceptors or pain receptors in the nasal mucosa, well, that's the trigeminal nerve picking those up. It's not anything to do with your sense of smell. So they're separate, okay? So trigeminal nerve through its branches are going to innervate the inside of the nasal cavity, so nasal mucosa, oral mucosa, tongue, teeth, etc. So any pressure, textures, or irritants, just like spicy food, we'll talk about that in a sec, um, it's not going to be uh, part of your sense of smell. So it's just showing the olfactory nerve here. Um, so yeah, it's these little fibers that dangle through the cribriform plate, which is part of the ethmoid bone, into the superior part of the nasal cavity. They're connected to chemoreceptors, so little odorants in the air bind to these little receptors or olfactory cells. They get transferred into action potentials in the actual factory nerve fibers, and this is going to go back to the brain. So some of these are going to go to the olfactory cortex, so the conscious part of your brain. And then all these, remember, all these special senses or all your senses are also going to have signals going back to the um, limbic system, which we talked about. Now, the olfactory nerve is the only nerve that does not synapse in the thalamus. Even the optic nerve is going to take a stop in the thalamus, and remember, the thalamus is the relay center for all the sensory information but olfaction is a very old sense um some like in rat brains these are called the well, they still might call it that the rhinocephalon like the limbic system is so tied in with sense of smell it's a very old sense obviously we don't rely on our sense of smell as much as other um, species do so that's all that's showing so you can also damage if you fracture the cribriform plate so like a skull fracture here if you break the bone it can damage the olfactory nerve it's another cause of a problem there so optic nerve, so, you know, we're, this is going to be for your vision, so obviously photoreception um, in the retina. So we test this, so with the counting finger methods, so you can do two fingers, two hands up here, and then down here, and the peripheral vision, hold up one or two fingers and have them tell you what my fingers are holding up. Obviously, it's one eye at a time. They have to keep looking at, like, the bridge of your nose, and you cover, you close the same eye. That they, So if they're covering their one eye, you, you close your same eye. And then you can do the little wiggly finger things if you say you think there is some kind of a visual field deficit. You could also do the Snellen chart for visual acuity. Um, obviously, pupillary right, light reflex test and swinging light test. Um, so this is showing that pathway coming back here. Um, there's a better picture of it. And then obviously, the visual cortex is in the occipital lobe. So it's got a ways to go back. Some of the fibers cross, some don't. So the three ways we test this. Remember, we're going to have to use the, so we're going to look at visual fields. So a factor number is just like the smell test. I don't know. So visual fields. The pupillary light reflex. So we know that's a good test, too. We talked about in class, it's not just testing crown nerve number two, sensing the light. It's actually also looking at crown nerve number three because that controls the pupillary constrictor muscles. So two has to sense the light, then three has to come back and constrict the pupil. Um, so you could put it under the swinging light test. Swinging, which we saw that demonstrated in class. Swinging light test. And then last, uh, oh yeah, you can check for visual acuity using a, a handheld Snellen chart if you wanted. Ooh. All right, sweet, there we go. So this is showing the visual fields again. You don't need to know this for testing purposes, but it's good to understand how this works. So. Basically, everything in your, see your left visual field, everything to your left, okay, is going to hit the right side of your retina in both eyes, meaning in the left eye, it's hitting the nasal part of the retina here, and the right eye, it's hitting the temporal part of the retina. So everything going to the left side, right, looking to your left, is going to hit those parts of the retina and wind up on the right side of your brain, okay? Everything in the right visual field... So in the right eye, it's going to hit the nasal part of the retina, and the left eye, it's going to hit the temporal part of the retina, or temporal part, whatever you want to say. That's going to wind up in the left hemisphere. What? Okay. 
So basically, everything that's coming into the right eye from the left is going to stay in the left hemisphere. Or, everything in the right eye coming from the left is going to stay in that hemisphere. Anything coming from the right is going to cross to the other side. Okay, same thing in the left eye. Everything from the right is going to stay on that side. Everything from the left is going to go to the opposite side. I don't know if I made any sense of that at all. But right here, the optic chiasm. So the optic chiasm right here. So that's where we have this decussation or some of the nerve fibers are, are crossing over. So optic chiasm, some people call it the optic chiasma. I don't think it really matters, but um, it's going to cross there before it synapses in the thalamus. And then these optic radiations, so these things here are called optic radiations that bring information back to the visual cortex and the occipital lobe. So vision's a little complicated, especially when you look at visual field de defects. Um, it just takes a little bit of studying, and you can figure it out. And this is the chart showing uh, what you see with... Um, visual field deficits so anything you know along these numbers will, will show up as these visual field deficits so two is the easiest one so if the optic nerve here is cut in two well you're going to not have any vision in the right eye so the optic nerve is completely cut right behind the retina then you're not seeing anything okay um let's say you know in one, you have a little de defect in part of the retina, so that means in the left eye, you'd be have a blind spot somewhere in the middle of the eye. Um, something like three, so this is a tough one because now you're cutting nerve fibers going from here, all right, and from here, so both the nasal part of the retina on the left and right eyes, so the inner, inner part sees outward, so you'd have visual deficits in the temporal visual field on the left, and the nasal, or sorry, or the left visual field in the left eye and the right visual field in the left and the right eye. So left and left, right and the right. So you'd have what you see in three here where the, the outer visual fields are, are deaf or deficient. <sighs> anyway, and you could have damage to the optic tracts here, damage to actual the geniculate nucleus somewhere in there, optic radiations anywhere along the way, but you don't have to know any of that. So... If you do notice a deficit, that's your job. Hey, I noticed this deficit. It seems like it's the, the right visual field in their right eye or whatever, and it can give you a clue of what's going on. Okay, but once if the counting finger methods is off, then you do little wiggly fingers coming in different directions and try to you know narrow it down to see whether they're having a, a defect. Okay, assessing extraocular movement. So here we're testing three, four. And six. So this is check in. Oc the motor nerve, so just three. So that's going to move the eye up, down, in. Okay, we're going to be checking four, which controls the superior oblique muscle, so this turns the eye down and out. Ooh. And then five, six, or abducens nerve, this just controls the lateral rectus, so it just moves the eye laterally. All right. So let's take a look at this. So here's the muscles inside the eye socket, basically, so in the orbit. So lateral rectus moves the eye laterally, or sometimes we say abduct the eye. And the inside of the eye of the meter rectus, so it moves the eye towards the nose, or adducts the eye, some people call it. We saw it in the video, superior rectus moves the eye upward, so it moves it superiorly looking up, or superducts. Infrarectus looks down or infradux, and that seems pretty straightforward. But then the two oblique muscles are kind of confusing. So the superior oblique muscle runs up here, and it goes to this little sling called the trochlea, and it's controlled by the trochlear nerve, this little pulley, and that comes down over the eye. So the superior oblique's superior to the eye, but actually rotates the eye, the eye out and downward, so looking down and out. All right. So I mean, if my right eye would be looking down and out to that side. So my superior rectus would be looking up, inferior rectus would be looking down, meter rectus would be looking in towards my nose, lateral rectus moving out, away. 
And then, yeah, so su superior oblique and inferior oblique. So superior oblique is pulling this. When it pulls this way, it turns my eye this way. That's superior oblique. And then inferior oblique is turning my eye upward and outward. Okay. So if you know one's on top, it's rolling it down. The one that's on the bottom, it's rolling it up. So you can see that here. So superior oblique. Well, that's not a great picture, but okay. So here we can see all the nerve fibers going into the orbit. So a bunch of different nuclei, um, but they're going to be sending fibers through, you know, these openings uh, in the back of the skull, through the sphenoid bone, um, and innervating all these muscles in the orbit or connecting to the eye. Okay. And you saw the chart there. So, yeah, ocular motor nerve. So, superior rectus, inferior rectus, meter rectus, inferior oblique. So, what that means is you can look up, down, in, and you can roll the eye up and out. But when people have a uh, ocular motor nerve palsy, the problem is they just can't look laterally, which makes sense because the superior oblique rotates the eye down and out, and the lateral rectus moves the eye laterally. It's the strongest one moving straight lateral. That's the only direction they can move. Okay, so ocular motor nerve palsy, so we're going to see the drooping of the eyelid, so we call this ptosis, so the drooping of the eyelid is called ptosis, not ptosis, it's ptosis, but P-T-O-S-I-S, -S. so it's drooping of the eyelid, and then the move, eye can only move laterally, we saw videos of this in class, so you can refer to those. Um, sometimes the pupil is dilated because the ocular motor nerve causes pupillary constriction, so we might see that. Not always, though. So it's just kind of explaining what's going on there. So again, para paralysis, super rectus, meter rectus, inferior rectus, inferior oblique. So all that's intact left is your lateral rectus and your, in, and your superior oblique, right? So it's your SO4 LR6. So trochlear nerve palsy, this one's a pretty significant, but we can see right here, this eye is elevated. So if the superior oblique muscle turns the eye down and out like this, and that muscle or that nerve is not working, right? It's paralyzed, so the muscle's not working. Well, guess what? The eye's gonna kind of track in the opposite direction. It's kind of up and in. Usually the eye just sits a little higher. The video we saw in class from the University of Michigan videos, you can barely tell the difference, but I've seen people, yeah, one eye is a little bit elevated compared to the other. That's usually a trochlear nerve palsy. Okay, but they cannot move their eye in pretty much every direction. Okay. Now, abducens nerve palsy. So we saw this. Well, remember what does the abducens nerve do? It turns the eye laterally, right? It turns this eye outward. This way. So when someone's looking straight ahead, what might happen? Well, the eye might track in towards the nose, right? Or when they go to look out, well, this eye won't move, it just looks straight ahead, and the other eye will look in towards the nose. And we saw videos of that as well. So, so if you want to go back to that, so remember, how do you remember these two? So for a tro trochlear nerve, so we know SO4, so superior oblique, is controlled by coronary 4, and then LR6, lateral rectus, is controlled by the sixth cranial nerve. Okay, so how do we test these things? Just to recap, so if we're going to test these, well, the first thing is the H, H test, so making sure the eyes are moving and they're symmetrical and they're moving nice and smooth. So we call it smooth pursuit, so the eyes are moving nice and smoothly. And then we talked about checking for what we call saccades. Just following your hand or, your, or something back and forth, right? And we're looking for, we don't see anything called nystagmus. So nystagmus is when there's, I talked about this in class, nystagmus is when the eyes kind of jerk back and forth, either side to side or, I mean, sometimes it can be up and down. So nystagmus, we don't want to see that. 
Okay, so trigeminal nerve number five. So this is doing sensory information back to the brain stem from V1, V2, and V3. So there's three branches. The ophthalmic does like the temporal to the eye. Maxillary goes right about here. And maxillary does the, around the jaw. It's also going to be taking some out of sensory information from the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, including the tongue and the teeth. So picking up textures of food and anything caustic to the nose or, or oral cavity. And the motor portion, so that's going to be the sensory portion. So sensory portion is going to be all that somatosensation sensation stuff. And then the motor portion, this is going to be muscles of mastication. So temporalis, temporalis masseter, and the pterygoid muscles. <clears throat> so testing for sensory, you just touch three areas. And you compare them. They feel the same? Yeah, okay. So light touch, you can do sharp dull, meaning you have closer eyes. You can break a, a contip applicator in half. So the sharp wood part, you can poke them. Say, does that feel sharp or dull? It should feel sharp. And then dull with the cotton part. Um, people use pin prick. You could, if you want to go as far as you can use cold and, and hot and check temperature sensation. Um, but you want to compare the two sides and you want to check in each you know, of the regions. You don't have to stick your fingers in the mouth or the nose. Um, or I wouldn't recommend it. Maybe. No, don't do that. So it's showing all the branches of the trigeminal nerve. So there's motor branches, sensory branches. So, But what this is showing, and you guys don't need to know all this, is a lot. Um, so here's V1, the ophthalmic branch, and see all the sub-branches of all that. It's a lot. Okay. And then the maxillary nerve right here is V2. Mess that up real bad. Looks awful. So V2. So V2, so all of its branches are underneath there. And the mandibular branch down here, which is V3. Okay. So how do we test this nerve? Well, well for the sensory part, again, we talked about, you got to check V1, V2, V3. And you can just do sharp and dull or however you want to do it and you'll learn health assessment what they want you to do um and then for the motor portion we'll have them bite down and you should feel here and here feel the temporalis muscle contracting feel the master muscle contracting you can open their jaw and try to close it as well and just check all those muscles around there okay so really it's assessing spelled assessing wrong <laughs> muscle bulk and tone as well as the strength right for muscles of mastication okay muscles oh wow this is going really bad right in my face ah okay okay let's keep moving on so again yeah v1 v2 v3 so checking here v1 touch here touch here touch here so this person looks like they have a palsy here you can see right in here that they have kind of hollowing out of their forehead right so if someone's real thin or has lost a lot of weight you'll see this um, but if you see it on one side, right, that kind of tells you something like, okay, why is there atrophy of this muscle? And we know, we talked about upper and lower motor, motor neuron lesions. So if you have a lower motor neuron lesion to these areas, well, the muscle is going to atrophy, right? And you're going to have, you know, weakness or if it's bad enough, you know, flaccid paralysis. And then obviously their bite strength will be affected. And you can see even the jaw is, the jaw is deviated when they're opening it. So facial nerve, so sensory portion is taste the anterior two thirds of the tongue, motor is muscles of facial expression, the salivary glands, so submandibular and sublingual, glossopharyngeal does the parotid gland, the other salivary gland, and also does the lacrimal gland um, for tear production. And the thing I don't have on here, I don't think, 
I won't think I'd ask on a test is the stapedius. reflex. So see this in the hearing structure, so it actually pulls the stapes away from the oval window when there's a really loud sound, and it's there to protect your hearing structures. Facial nerve controls it. I don't know, there's probably more to it than that, but I don't understand it. So, Okay, so there's six branches of the facial nerve. Um, Toys muscles of facial expression. It's basically all the muscles in the face other than the muscles of mastication. So all this here. Just not the temporalis master and the pterygoids are deep underneath the mandible anyway so things wrinkle your forehead close your eyes um, wrinkle your nose move your eye nose around pull your corners of your mouth up or the top of your lips up like this or bottom lips down corner lips down there's even a muscle in your chin that wrinkles your chin called the mentalis muscle so all these things so orbicularis ocular orbicularis or zygomaticus major zygomaticus major uh, minor major uh the um Bucinator muscle, uh, levator labii superior, superioris, you know, depressor labii inferioris, and then the angu angular ones are called anguli oris. There's all these muscles. You don't have to know all those. Okay. Corrugator supercilia muscle, right, to do this. There's all these little muscles. So the facial nerve is controlling those. So how do you assess the facial nerve? Well, you have to move their face around. So they can do what? They can wrinkle their forehead or raise their eyebrows so raise their eyebrows they can close their eyes real tight so close eyes um, puff cheeks and you can always have your patient smile and you can resist some of those movements as well to check for muscle strength to how strong their face muscles are. So this is a palsy of facial nerve. So obviously you can see which side is affected when the person goes to smile, when they go to close uh, their eyes. So here, it uh, doesn't look too bad. This little side of the lips drooping a little bit. And they go to smile. Well, this corner of the mouth pulls up and out due to the zygomaticus major and minor muscles. Um, this pu nose pulls up. You can see the eye but nothing happens around this eye and the corner of the mouth and this face just looks basically paralyzed. And when you close the close the eyes, this eye stays open. So the muscle around the eye that closes the eye, not the eyelid, that's the levator palpebrae from the oculomotor nerve, but the orbicularis oculi, the circular muscle around the eye is paralyzed. So you can't even, sometimes the eye will stay a little bit open. Bell's palsy, special name for facial nerve palsy. Don't need to know that. Okay, so this, so side note about taste. We talked about the facial nerve doing taste. So really, um, there's three nerves that affect taste. So really just focus on this picture on the left. So this is going to be five, six, seven. So the facial nerve does this part. They enter two-thirds. We haven't got to nine and ten yet, but this is nine. So this is glossopharyngeal nerve. So that's going to be doing the posterior one-third. And actually, we call it the root of the tongue way in the back the vagus nerve is going to be doing taste sensation from back there. Okay. Um, don't worry about the right. So regular somatic sensation here. So um, on the tongue. So that's all going to be from five. Really. So here, this is just somatic sensation. Well, this is going to be. I said to not think about it, but I'm still doing it for some reason. Five. Right. But then once you get back to the throat, somatic sensation is going to come from 9 and then 10. Um, so that's why you check like gag reflex and everything. When you get back to the back of the throat, that's what you're checking. Okay. And the motor function, obviously the motor of the tongue's hypoglossal nerve, the motor of the pharyngeal muscles are 9 and 10. Okay. We're going to get there. So different taste buds. So obviously sweet is going to bind to sweet things like glucose and fructose. Salty is going to bind to things like sodium chloride. I talked about salt substitutes with like potassium, like potassium chloride can also stimulate those. Um, so these taste receptors, I should say, they're modified epithelial cells. They're chemoreceptors, um, and they're going to bind to these different things in your food, right? Um, sour, anything with acid in it. So hydrogen ions are acid. So the most common example I can use for naturally occurring uh, sour things is in citrus fruit, right? So lemons and limes especially, they're citric acid, okay? In sour candy you eat, they actually put citric acid in or other acids in it to give it a sour taste. Umami is also called savory. 
it's usually different amino acids bind there. So I always think of like a meaty type flavor or like a steak. I never need steak, but you know, something with a, a protein dense kind of flavor. That's awful way of explaining it. And all in the back bitter. So in the bitters in the back. So bitter are usually very alkaline compounds. Okay, so a lot of vegetables are bitter. It's because they're very alkaline, which is alkaline things can be good for you in your diet, but they do have a bitter taste, right? So a lot of little kids don't want to eat, you know, spinach. Okay, so sweet at the tip, salty here, so sodium chloride, umami or savory is in the middle, and sour is on the outside. That's your taste. So a good question is what three nerves control taste? Well, it's going to be seven. Nine and ten. All right, so this is showing the taste pathway. So obviously, the sensory portions of these nerves and control of taste are going to bring this back to the gustatory cortex and the temporal lobe and also to the limbic system, right? Limbic, limbic, limbic system. Vestibular cochlear nerve. So this is number eight. So cranial nerve number eight. So this has two portions to it but it runs together to the inner ear inside the temporal bone because that's where all these things are going on so the vestibular branch so this has two structures the semicircular canals for dynamic equilibrium so that's when you're moving in circles and then the utricle and saccule for static equilibrium so i turn my head down and hold it here there's little rocks in there that move and they shift on this gel membrane and bend these little hair cells and that information goes back to my cerebellum and says hey head is now in this position I'm turning my head like this and moving it around. The semicircular canals are in charge of that. There's fluid that circulates around. It bends these little hair cells back and forth. That's why it's moving. That's why I always give the same example. You spin in circles, spin, 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 stop moving. You feel like you're still moving. It's because the fluid in the semicircular canals is still moving. It's got to slow down and stop, just like you're making a whirlpool inside a pool. Now, hearing, the hearing structure is called the cochlea, and it's something called the organ of corti. So vibrations get transmitted to the inner ear and then again hair cells and these and these in the, in the cochlea get bent back and forth and that turns into action potentials and sends things back to your auditory cortex which is in your temporal lobe and we got our auditory cortex and our, our uh, wernicke's area that's just showing the pathway of this nerve um so it's gonna it's sensory right so it's innervating so the structures of the utricle and the saccule and the semicircular canals um, and from the cochlea, and that's going to bring it back into the brain, like we just talked about. So here we got our different structures here. So for equilibrium, so we have the utricle here and the saccule here. So these have little otoliths that are on this gel membrane that move back and forth for static equilibrium. Then we got these canals. So there's three canals, a superior canal, a posterior canal, and a lateral canal so these are in charge of dynamic equilibrium and we can see which portion of the nerve here so this is all the vestibular part of the nerve here okay and then the cochlea this is for our hearing this is going back through the cochlear part of the vestibular cochlear nerve So we can see the hearing structures inside here. So inside here. Um, so for hearing, so what happens? All right, so sound waves go through the air like this. Like there's wavelength and frequency. As long as the frequency that can vibrate this, right? Real high frequency sometimes won't vibrate our, ear, our eardrum or our tympanic membrane, which is this structure right here. And we won't hear them. Okay, when this vibrates, so, the, so the, it's the auditory canal or the ear canal. This is the temporal bone, okay? So the middle and inner ear structures are inside the temporal bone. This starts to vibrate. Then it vibrates these three little bones in the middle ear. So the malleus is here, the incus and the stapes. Malleus is supposed to mean hammer, incus, anvil, and stapes, stirrup. And the, the stapes definitely looks like a stirrup. So like with this tapedius reflex we talked about, there are little muscles attaching to these, and the facial nerve will pull the stapes away from the um, oval window here and try to protect our hearing structures from getting damaged. So loud noises will cause sensory neural hearing loss over time. So these little bones vibrate. They vibrate the oval window, and then that's going to vibrate structures in the cochlea. Okay, and the little hair cells bend. gets transmitted to action potentials back through the auditory part of the nerve, right? So the, the um, cochlear part of the vestibular cochlear nerve. 
So that's basically how hearing works. The middle ear here, we can see the eustachian tube here. So this normalizes pressure, especially if there's excess fluid buildup will drain through this eustachian tube into the pharynx from the middle ear. So normalizing pressure. So this is what happens in the utricle and the sacules. We see otoliths, otoliths. So where's otoliths? Right here, and they're on this gel membrane. And when you move your head down like this, the, the little otoliths move and they bend these hair cells. Now the problem is if one of these otoliths gets wedged up into the semicircular canals, this is how we get one of the most common types of vertigo called benign positional, benign proxismal positional vertigo, or BPPV. If a rock gets stuck in the semicircular canal and bends the hair cells in the semicircular canals, well, it's telling the brain, hey, your head's moving when you're not moving, and you feel like the room's spinning or getting pulled down to the ground or, or passing out or whatever happens. So that's right here. So B, B, P, B, V. And those are our types of vertigo, too. But we don't have time to get into that. we got to get moving here. So types of hearing loss, we talked about sense neural hearing loss, first conductive loss, pretty self-explanatory, and there are mixed types of hearing loss. So putting your hands by someone's ears and just doing this, can you hear me on this side? Which ear do you, which ear do you hear me on? Does it sound equal and, you know, in strength and whatever? Um, but, you know, using a tuning fork and doing the Weber or Renee's test we explained in class, if you do these correctly, it can tell you whether there's sense neural hearing loss, conductive hearing loss, or potentially both. So, and we went over all those in class. Um, you can refer to that video we watched, or we'll talk about it in class more. But I'm running out of time. So, glossopharyngeal nerve and vagus nerve. So, these are have motor and sensory comp uh, components. Like I said, some of the things I'm not going to go over here. So, glossopharyngeal nerve, it's bringing information back about blood pressure from the carotid sinus and pH CO2 and O2 from the carotid bodies. Um, that's going to come up next quarter in the respiratory and cardiovascular systems, respectively. I think I'm flipped around. And the vagus nerve we'll talk about here in a little while because um, of its huge parasympathetic component and also its visual, uh, visual, visceral sensory component, right? And we'll talk about that for organs like your heart, your lungs, um, all your GI organs, um, all the way up to your splenic flexure of your colon. So all that stuff, the parasympathetic por portion of that control, which we'll get to in the autonomic nervous systems through the vagus nerve. But as far as a cranial nerve exam and head and neck stuff, well, we're looking at swallowing and make sure the pharyngeal, or pharyngeal muscles are working properly. Gag reflex, make sure they can sense something in the back of the throat for proper swallow and gag and all that. And then also with the vagus nerve through the recurrent laryngeal nerve, so it innervates the muscles of the vocal cords. So if someone has a hoarseness of the voice, problems with phonation, that could be an issue with specifically the vagus nerve. And that you're not going to do a specific test, you're just going to listen to the person talk while you're interviewing them. So that's showing all the nuclei there. Showing the extent of the vagus nerve um, as well. Okay, so here, say so, ah. Uh, so look right here, what's happening? Well, my uvula is deviating to the left, and you can't see the color very well. So my uvula is deviating to the left. Why is it deviating to the left? Because look, this arch here is not rising. So what does that mean? That means the potential palsy is on the right. So the uvula is deviating to the good side. And the gag reflex, well, we're going to go back here. And we're going to take a little swab and touch here and touch here and each side, right? So if this is not rising and there's the last gag reflex on the right, that means there's a possible issue with 9 or 10, 9 and or 10 on the right. Accessory nerve, so this is going to do two muscles, trapezius muscle, so elevating the shoulder, sternocleidomastoid, rotating the head to the opposing side. And that shows the branches there going to the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle, so here's the sternal head, here's the clavicular head, so it's going to be inserting on the masseter, which is, or, well, inserting on the mastoid process, which is the part of the bone, the temporal bone, the lumpy part behind your ear, um, and then the upper trapezius muscle there. So shrugging the shoulders and push down, make sure they're strong. Have them turn the head and push against them, make sure their head's strong. So hypoglossal nervous is going to do the nerves inside the tongue and outside the tongue. So what do you do? You have them protrude their tongue and move their tongue around. Showing the branches there, going to the intrinsic muscles, the muscles in the tongue. Extrinsic muscles, the muscles underneath the tongue. So here the tongue is deviating to... the right. 
So this should be going straight out, but the tongue is going this way. So what side is the lesion? It's going to be on the right because this part of the tongue is not. This part of the tongue is pushing out just fine. This side is not. So what's going to happen? It's going to deviate to the bad side. Well, there's your cranial nerves. Hopefully that helps.